integral mission, and we've talked, talked about how that came about, um, and also the biblical idea. Paul was just saying, Pastor Paul was just saying, we need a two-handed gospel. Yeah, I think that's a, a good expression as well. But um, let's just look at this Micah declaration. So somebody, perhaps uh, Julian, can you re read out in a loud voice that Micah declaration down here? She's gonna read it. She's gonna read it. Yeah, she's, she's really proper. Oh, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, she's gonna read it. Yeah. Go for it. Go for it, Liliana. Integral mission or holistic transformation is the proclamation and demonstration of the gospel. It is not simply simply that evangelism and social involvement are to be done alongside each other. Rather, in integral mission, our proclamation has social consequences as well as we call people to love and repentance in all areas of life. And our social involvement has evangelistic consequences as we bear witness to the transforming grace of Jesus Christ. So, sometimes, we can um, do the social involvement and the evangelism together. Uh, particularly in a, in a context, for example, in this country, where although people are resistant to the gospel and they don't like to hear the gospel, actually we have freedom to preach the gospel. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> now, of course, in many, many countries of the world, that is not the case. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you go to somewhere like Afghanistan, or Iran, or Pakistan even, you will find that actually the restrictions are very significant, particularly if you go there as a foreigner. Now, the local Christians are often very, very courageous in, in, in still sharing the gospel, uh, but it is much more difficult. And actually, as a foreigner, if you went to Afghanistan, and you stood on the street of Kabul, and you did what you do outside Southern Street Station, then that More risky, no, yeah. would be a risk not only to you, but actually to other people as well associated with you. So that might not be a very good approach in that context of Afghanistan. Okay. In Sutton. <laughs> but even then, what consequences is that going to have on other Christians yeah. in their area? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so so we, need, we need to be careful. So, so sometimes we can do the evangelism, we can feed people and share the gospel with them at one and the same time. And that's great if we can. But this suggests that sometimes that is not possible. And so it says that if we are doing proclamation, so if we are doing evangelism, then our evangelism or our proclamation should have social consequences. Okay. Why? Because we call people to love and repentance in all areas of their life. So this is in contrast to a gospel which says, repent of your sins, believe in Jesus, and you will go to heaven when you die. So the escape, the escape hatch to heaven message of the gospel. Okay. Now that is true. Yeah, well, I'm, not, I'm not saying that's not true. But if we limit the gospel just to that message, then actually we are limiting the consequences of that message. So if we truly come to understand what Jesus has done for us, that will lead to changes in the way that we live our lives and the whole of our lives. Yeah? Not that we will continue what we have always been doing from Monday to Friday and then on Saturday we'll watch the football on Sunday we'll go to church. Yeah, But actually it will impact on every aspect of our lives. And I think within this room we have people who are evidence of that. But you're saying that when you came to Christ, your life was completely changed. 
Yeah. It wasn't that you continued with your life as it was, but you knew you were going to heaven. Yeah. But actually that encounter with the Holy Spirit, yeah. that conversion experience you had changed your I think the yeah. only real um, you know, even the Bible says work out your salvation with being trembling. The, yeah. the, the, I'd say the most amazing assurance we have actually of heaven is our relationship with the Almighty. Yeah. That is our assurance. I think if you want to chance it, you know, on a few words, you know, that it's safe in the mouth. Yeah. It, I don't know how far that will go to be honest. But yeah. I think, um, yeah, definitely, you know, even the Bible says, you know, don't say you will ascend or you will descend. It's, yeah. it's yeah. about actually, when you understand the gospel, you understand, right, actually, I'm not spending all my time just looking to heaven or just thinking, oh, I'm an end of life, I'm going there, but understand the kingdom of heaven is within you. You understand, oh, yeah. I can experience heaven now and share this experience with others. That's the will of God, not to wait till you're dead to know him now. Actually, if you don't know him now, then you'll never know him. That's yeah. the truth, actually. You have to know him personally. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the gospel that we share with people should not be a diluted gospel. I was I was just sharing with, actually with a, some friends last night that I, um, a number of years ago, uh, I had a colleague who um, he was older than me. We worked quite closely together for a period of three years. And he was um, a lovely guy, you know, but he was not a Christian. We used to talk together, and I used to challenge him and say, you know, you should come to Christ. You should put your put your faith in Jesus. And he used to say, Mark, the problem is that if I do that, my life will have to change too much. <laughs> <laughs> At least he understands that. Yeah, now, but, but the problem was with me because I I didn't say this, but I very nearly said to this because this guy was a he was a lovely guy. You know, there was no very clear sin in his life. Yeah, he was happily married, he had children, he, you know, he... And I, I was tempted to say, Derek, no, 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 you won't have to change your life very much. Just put your faith in Jesus. Yeah. But of course, that would have been the wrong thing to say. And he actually understood the gospel better than me! <laughs> because he said, actually, no, the, the implications are too simple for me. Now, I, I'm not sure I've sort of lost that feeling, but my prayer is that he, he will have the courage to make that commitment. But I think we are sometimes in danger of doing that, of, of kind of trying to make the gospel more palatable, yeah? easier to swallow, yeah? by saying, no, no, it's fine. It won't, won't make that much difference. It just make no difference now, just the difference in, in when you die. But of course, that is not not the case, and I think you know for those of you here who've come from more more difficult, more challenging backgrounds, and then you have experienced that power, of that transforming power of the gospel in a way that that actually I have not done. You know, I have grown up in a Christian family, missionary parents. Yeah, I cannot. I I have made a commitment to Christ. I did that when I was 13 years old. I committed to go to the mission field when I was about 18 years old. I've known Christ work in my life, but I've never had a dramatic turnaround experience. And so, I wish sometimes that I did. I sometimes wish. Oh, I know, I know, be careful. And that is not, it's naive of me. <laughs> but sometimes I think, you know, if I could point to that time when I, you know, had a dramatic change in my life, yeah, yeah. then I would be more effective in, in sharing the gospel with others. And I, and I think in some ways that's true. Because, so I guess what I'm saying is that I would encourage you guys, if you have that kind of experience, then to share that experience with others as you do and say, this is what I was like before, like Paul does. And he says, this is who I was before, this is what I did, I persecuted the church, but now look at me. And that is such a powerful sharing of the gospel. So I confess that I am not good 
even though I teach in a mission training college, I am not a good evangelist. In fact, I'm a very poor evangelist. That is not an excuse. That is an area that I need to work on. And one of the reasons is, is that I, and this is why God brought me here today, is that I can forget the power of the gospel, the transforming power of the gospel. Because although I have <coughs> experienced it to a certain extent, I have not experienced it in that dramatic way. Now, my, my calling, I would say, on that spectrum, because I think what God has gifted you for is also important. You know, my, my calling has been, because of my background, has been really to work with those people who uh, live in poverty, particularly away from my own country. Okay. Um, and when we were in Nepal, Nepal is not like Afghanistan, but it is also not like Uganda. So Uganda, I think you're, you're get, somebody's going yeah, to Uganda. Pedro, you're going to Uganda. Have you been to Uganda before? Sorry? No, I've been to Uganda before. So my Uganda... Oh, all the injections! So Uganda... <laughs> is a, nowadays, 80% Christian. Probably 80% of the, the, you know, so the majority of people in Uganda would say that they were Christians. Now, yeah, it's a huge number. It's a huge number. So it is a Christian country. There are Muslims there as well. Um, now, some would say that in some parts of the country, the, the, um, the penetration of the gospel and how much it has changed people is, as it anywhere, is debatable. So, for example, you know, the, the levels of corruption in Uganda are very, very high. So you have lots of Christians in positions of influence in the country, but you still have corruption. And the same, you can say the same about many other, many other countries, that they are Christian countries, but they are highly corrupt. So how does... How does that go together? So that, that suggests that people have just spiritualized that gospel, that they feel that they can be a Christian, but actually it doesn't affect how they operate on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, whether they give bribes or receive bribes. That's just one story. Mm -hmm. uh, I found that yesterday from, mm -hmm. from yesterday, the college. Uh, yeah. uh, there are more Christian countries in Africa Sure, that's right. So now, now <coughs> the majority of Christians in the world come from Africa, South Asia, South America. In the past, it was in the West, where we are now. But now that center of Christianity has shifted. Yes. The, the West has become secular. Yeah. yeah. But it is those countries who now actually are, to, are turning to Christ. And that will have profound significance in the future. I mean, our, in some ways, the values that we have in the Western societies, some of those values are, are biblical values. That is a legacy from our, our faith of the past. But we are losing those very rapidly. Very, very rapidly. And those countries are actually now gaining those values, and those values will transform those countries. Just one thing. Sure. Maybe after the Brexit, everyone will be changed into Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps the Lord will come before Brexit happens. That would be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, Brexit. <laughs> Don't worry, Pedro, you're almost free. <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, no, uh, yesterday I received a uh, confirmation that I can stay in. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll press <laughs> <laughs> so, so in the Nepal context, um, as a foreigner, I worked for a mission organization. Okay. Um, and that mission organization started working in Nepal in 1950. Okay. So uh, up until 1950, Nepal was a closed country. No foreigners were allowed side inside the country. And so all the, there were no Christians in Nepal at that time. Uh, if people came to Christ, they were thrown out of the country. And it was a Hindu, Hindu kingdom. Okay. Now, in 1950, that changed, and the, the politics changed. And there were a number of um, 
mission organizations who were on the border of India and Nepal. And they'd been there for many years doing medical work, but also sharing the gospel. And Nepalis used to come from Nepal into India to get the medical treatment. They heard the gospel, then they went back into Nepal. But then the border of Nepal was opened up. And those mission organizations were allowed in. But they were told, you can come here, but you must not <coughs> plant churches, and you must not preach the gospel. Okay? You can be Christian. We don't mind that you are Christian. And you can tell people that you are Christian. But please don't turn people into Christians. <laughs> <laughs> Now, what, what do you think the mission organization said? <coughs> what, what was the response from the mission organizations, do you think? No. <laughs> no. No. They probably agree in anyway. So what happened was that I, I recently saw a letter, actually, one of the first letters written from one of those meetings. And uh, in it, the, the missionary said to the, the government, we cannot help <coughs> but preach Christ. Yeah, so we will come and we will serve you as a people. We will bring you health care. We will help you with education. Uh, we will help you with <coughs> agriculture, these kind of things. But as we do that, we cannot help but share the gospel. Amen. Yeah. And the, the, the response from the government was, okay, but you must not plant churches and you must not preach the gospel. <laughs> okay. But they are Muslim countries or uh, Hindu countries? So they said, so they started work in, those, in, in a number of different places, particularly on health work. So we established hospitals, uh, we established schools, and uh, we were very clear. So in the hospital, it said, we serve, Jesus heals. Mm. Okay. And even through the time of persecution of Christians in that country, that hospital said, we serve, Jesus heals. Mm. Okay. Now, as an organization, we were not allowed <coughs> to do evangelism events. But the missionaries within those organizations always felt a burden to share the gospel. Now they couldn't do that and go out and do that on the street corner. But people would often say to them, why have you come to this country? We know that your country is much better than ours. That's what they thought. So why have you come here? Those organizations did a lot of work with people who had leprosy. Do you know about leprosy? Yeah, yeah. So leprosy is a terrible disease that, that you lose your fingers and the nose, you become very disfigured. Um, and people, just like in the, in the biblical times, mm -hmm. Jesus touched the lepers. Yeah. So missionaries all over the world have often had a ministry to people with leprosy. Mm -hmm. And those people, just like in Bible times, were often rejected by their own community. So if you were found to have leprosy, you would be thrown out of your community. They would say, you cannot live here, go and live in the forest, go and live in the cave on the mountain or, or wherever it was. Yeah. And then the missionaries came and they showed concern for those people who were marginalized with leprosy. They treated them medically, but they also helped them to live their life uh, uh, and, and survive uh, for some, from some income and this kind of thing. And of course they asked. Any thoughts? Jesus. We've been sent by Jesus. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. We care for you because Jesus loves you. He's mm. demonstrated his love for us. Yeah. And he has demonstrated his love for you. So they then had that opportunity to share the gospel with you.
in this far off land. Mm. And they were able to share the gospel. So many of the churches in Nepal were actually started by people with leprosy. Oh, wow. Because they became the main missionaries within their country. Mm. And they went around the country. Sometimes, you know, they were quite severely disabled, disfigured, um, and they had courage in preaching the gospel. And so, around the uh, around the, the country, there are churches founded by people with leprosy who reach out to the So that, that so that's what the Micah Declaration means when our social action has evangelistic consequences. Mm. So sometimes things can be done together. Sometimes. We focus on evangelism, but we have to make sure that we are preaching the whole gospel and that we are getting people to repent and change all aspects of their lives, not reducing the gospel down just to the speak. But in the same way, when we engage with people socially, when we demonstrate compassion to them, then that should lead the way to actually opening them up to, to share the gospel with them. Now, in a place like Afghanistan, I have friends who have worked in Afghanistan. And uh, in Afghanistan, probably more missionaries have died in Afghanistan than in any other country in the world. Uh, so these people who are, are passionately committed to Christ, uh, willing to risk their lives by going to Afghanistan. Um, but they may never know whether anybody has come to Christ through them, yeah, through their ministry. Now, we know that the church in Afghanistan is growing. Yeah. No one knows how much. Yeah. No one has counted. No one can mm. count. But if somebody comes to Christ in Afghanistan, they have to be very, very careful who they tell. Mm. Yeah. And sometimes mm. people will come to Christ, but actually there will be a kind of hidden believer. And then eventually they will link up with other believers in that context. They will meet together secretly. But those people are faithfully doing what God has called them to do. And I believe that God uses them in that context. And so that has kingdom impact as well. So the, the calling is important. The context is important. Um, and, uh, yeah. In 2010, there was another big conference, just like there was in 1974 in Switzerland, that we talked about with Billy Graham and John Stott. So 2010 in Cape Town in South Africa. And um, on your handout, There's another, another statement <coughs> which, uh, which talks about this term integral mission that we've been looking at. Uh, so who would like to read us out in a mouth loud voice this statement? Yeah, you go for it. Yeah. Integral mission means discerning, proclaiming, and living out the biblical truth that the gospel is God's good news through the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ for individual persons and for society and for creation. <coughs> all three are broken and suffering because of sin. All three are included in the redeeming love and mission of God. All three must be part of the comprehensive mission of God's people. Cape Town is the commitment. Commitment. Yeah. So this so this is a small yeah this is a small section a small extract from a longer statement so when these theologians get together in their big conferences they produce these long statements okay. and uh, and this is just a, a small extract of that statement okay. so integral mission means discerning proclaiming and living out so the Micah Declaration talked about proclamation and demonstration. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, this uses slightly different language. 
So it says discerning, working out. You know, I, I, there, are, there are many very different definitions of mission. Yeah? How do we define mission? And there are long statements on this. My favorite definition of mission is joining in with what God is doing. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So mission is joining in with what God is doing. It's not that we bring God into a situation. Yeah. And sometimes our missionaries have reacted like that. Sometimes you'll see, often from America, I'm sad to say, <laughs> like in the airport, you know, they'll go on a short-term mission trip and they will all be wearing T-shirts, taking Jesus to Nicaragua. Yeah. <laughs> now, that is very well intentioned, but I think when they get there, they will find that Jesus was already there. <laughs> they, there was no need to pack Jesus in the suitcase and, and, and take him along. With him. <laughs> so, God is already at work. Yeah. And our job is to find out what God is doing. Yeah. We do that through Scripture. Yeah. And we talked about that big arc of scripture, that story. But we also find out what, what God is doing by walking through the streets, talking to people, meeting with local believers, yeah. you know, and finding out what God is doing, working out how we can join them with that. So I think this, this idea of discerning is about that, working out what God is doing. Then proclaiming, we talked about proclaiming, so sharing the gospel verbally but also living out. <coughs> so this is not just what we do, yeah. Yeah, but it is also how do we live our lives. Yeah. It's not that now I am a Christian, I go to church on Sunday, and I go to the homeless shelter on Thursday, yeah. but actually every aspect of my life has Praise turned around. Yeah. And as we've said, that is the most powerful witness. People who knew me before, and know me now, they know that I am a different person. Is that right, Benji? When you meet people, do they say, what happened to you? <laughs> yeah. And that, what happened to you? I became a Christian. I met Jesus. And that's, yeah, amazing. So living out the biblical truth that the gospel is God's good news through the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then this is interesting. It says, for individual persons. So it is good news for you, Pedro, as an individual. Yeah. For you, Benji, as an individual. For me, Mark. For you, Liliana. For Julian. Yeah. For Andrew. For Jay. For Paul. Yeah. It's good news for us as individuals. Yeah. But it is also good news for society. The gospel is good news for Sutton. Yeah. Yeah. It is good news for London. It is good news for the UK. Amen. It is good news for Europe. Amen. In fact, it's good news for the world. For the whole world. So our mission, joining in with what God is doing, is about, yes, individual people, but actually also being a transforming presence in society. Now, Pastor Paul was telling me how you have a very good relationship with the police. Yeah. Yeah. and the social services yeah. and the social services ring you up and say please can you put this person up in the <laughs> flat upstairs yeah. Yeah. why do you have a good relationship to, with the police because through the ministry that you have had some very dangerous people have had their lives changed yeah. Yeah. so actually Sutton is a safer place because Amen. of this church Amen. Amen. good news for society Amen. for Sutton Amen. and then this last one is quite interesting so it's good news for individual persons and for society yeah. and for creation why is it good news for creation Any thoughts? 
creation. I, I, this, is, this is quite a difficult question to answer, but I see for myself sometimes, and I can be somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. And for it, obviously, um, obviously, the king of heaven is within us, but it doesn't yeah. mean we always see with spiritual eyes. You know? yeah. But sometimes God might open my eyes for a few moments, and I look around, and I see, uh, like, uh, I, this is very supernatural, actually. I see like a bird flying or something. Uh-huh. And I see the trees and things like this, and I see, you know, what it would be like in the Garden of Eden. I see God restoring the earth. I don't really know how to explain it, but spiritually, you know, for a second, my eyes are like, wow, you know. I see, you know, God is. Um, it's like now, we, again, when we know God, it's again the shalom, it comes back. But it's not just us, it's everything around us, actually. God. Mm-hmm. Is uh, yeah. working through us to restore around, and it is very much supernatural. I don't know exactly to say, oh, he's doing this or he's doing yeah. this, but yeah. through we can't heal the situation ourselves. But when we are in him, he heals all the situation. Around us. So yeah. he and yeah, practically he will use us, you know, as new creations to how should I say, live in a proper way, you know, care for uh, people, the environment. Uh, animals, everything in the way that he was designed. So as we walk with him, actually, for one, we care for for the earth, the people on it primarily, and then everything else, which actually is, goes together. Actually, you can't separate. Yeah. You know, yeah. if we care for ourselves and we care for what's around us, yeah. and then yeah. we set an example also mm-hmm. for other yeah. things. Yeah. So, but like I said, we can only do so much in a specific area. But when we are in him. He heals everything around. Yeah. Yeah. So if we go back to the creation story, we missed this out. Well, we, we talked about Adam's work. Yeah. The fact that work was a good thing that came before the fall. And Adam and Eve were given responsibility for looking after the garden. Actually, not just looking after, as in keeping it the same, but actually making it even better. It's interesting, isn't it, that God called it good, and then he called it very good, but he never called it perfect. Mm. Now, what is the difference between very good and perfect? (laughs) (laughs) The big difference. If you get very good on your assignment from Pastor Paul, it means that it's very good, but it is not 100%. There is still room for improvement. Possible. Does anybody ever get perfect? You write perfect no, uh, on the assignment. <laughs> <laughs> we don't get all notions either. <laughs> perfect means no room for improvement. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Just for so the fact that the garden was called good and very good reflects the fact that Adam and Eve were given the job to actually look after it, actually to make it even better. Yeah, yeah. And that was the creativity that's part of being made in God's image. Yeah. Was that? And of course, we still have that responsibility today yeah, to look after creation. That is people, but it is also the wider creation. Now, here in Sutton, you have some trees. <coughs> I can see some trees over there. So not, I don't know how much natural environment that you have around here. But, of course, mankind or humankind have not done this very well. We have not looked after creation. In fact, we have done the opposite. We have exploited it. So one of the big significant um, implications of that is climate change. Now you probably don't experience the impact of climate change directly very very much here in Sutton. Because Morrison's always stops food. Yeah. If you want some food, if you have a little money in your pocket, you go down to Morrison's, as you've just done, and you buy some food. <laughs> but there are areas of the world mm. where there are no Morrison's. Mm. And people rely on the water that they collect from a well, mm. the crops, the food that they grow in the field. And the wells are drying up. The food is no longer there because the rains don't come at the same time as they used to. They may not come at all 
or if they do come, all the rain falls in one time mm. and washes everything away. And so the consequences of climate change are very, very significant. Mm. Now, as Christians, because of that just vertical individualistic gospel that we have had as evangelicals, we have also contributed to that and not really challenged how the world has used its natural resources. But now, there is a recognition that actually what God is doing is also reconciling the whole of creation. Mm. So as part of mission, this whole area of creation care <coughs> has now come onto the agenda. Okay. Mm. What does that look like? Well, there's a, a group in South Hall uh, called Arosha, which means the rock. And they are a Christian organization. And they have an amazing ministry that is focused on creation care. Mm. So their ministry, they, there was an old plot of land you know, which was used. There was lots of rubbish thrown there. Mm. Uh, I think there was probably a, you know, uh, this, when all the cars come, a boot sale. You know, boot sales? Yeah. Mm. People bring their junk ah, yeah. and they sell their junk to each other. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then lots of things get thrown yeah. away. Yeah. <laughs> and what they did is that they worked with the council and they said, please give us this land and we will restore it. And they changed it. They cleared all the rubbish out. They took about 20 tons of rubbish away mm. from that area. They dug some ponds. They planted some trees. And that now is a beautiful, uh, like a na nature reserve in that area. Amen. They have an area where they grow their own vegetables. And many people from the community come and grow vegetables in that area. Amen. And when people come and say, wow, why did you do all this? Oh, what do you think they say? <laughs> we have a God who cares about these things. Yeah. And so their demonstration of their care of creation has those proclamation consequences. So people come to Christ because they see what they have done in terms of caring for creation. Now, they would argue that even if nobody came to Christ, this is what God has called us to do, so we will still do it. We will still witness to Christ even if we don't see much spiritual fruit. But the fact is that they are seeing spiritual fruit and God is blessing that ministry that they have. So this statement goes a little bit further than the Micah statement and brings this idea of creation in there as well. Recognizing that all three, both individual persons, society and creation, are broken and suffering because of sin, which is what we looked at. All three, individual persons, society and creation, are included in the redeeming love and mission of God. And all three must be part of the comprehensive mission of God's people. So, mission, joining in with what God is doing, is perhaps much bigger than we have thought it has, was in the past. Perhaps before we thought of mission as going overseas yeah, and focusing on proclamation, but now we see that actually we need to have a holistic understanding of the gospel, a gospel that impacts on every aspect of our lives, and a gospel that impacts on individuals, on society, but also wider creation. Amen? Amen. Yeah. And we're bang on one at 12 o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you give the clown for it?